Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. It's often tempting to think that the notes we use are set in stone. We divide the octave into 12 steps, each the same distance wide. That's just how it works. Basically, every piece of music we listen to follows that same system, so it makes sense that we'd start to see it as an actual rule, but in reality, it's just one of many possible ways to map the tonal space, which is a fancy way of saying we can find different sets of notes if we try, and one person who tried very successfully was a Mexican-American theorist named Irvin Wilson. Wilson was a longtime associate of Harry Parch, inventor of the Genesis scale, a 43-note monster of a scale designed to demonstrate Parch's ideas about tonality. Wilson had a similar philosophy, but where Parch went big, Wilson's vision was smaller. A lot smaller. His most famous work is probably the hexony, which is made up of only six notes, but it manages to fit an absurd amount of variety and color in that fairly limited collection. First though, we have to talk about Parch and Wilson's goal, just intonation. Basically, this is the idea that the intervals between our notes should be mathematically pure. What does that mean? Well, when you hear a note, what you're really hearing is a sound wave with a specific frequency, and when you hear multiple notes at once, your ear effectively calculates the ratios between those frequencies. Generally, intervals sound more consonant when there is simple small number ratios like 2 to 1 for the octave or 3 to 2 for the perfect fifth, and advocates for just intonation argue that we should tune our instruments to not just approximate those ratios but perfectly reproduce them, creating completely consonant intervals. At least, mathematically speaking. The hexony was part of Wilson's contribution to this effort. It's the smallest, interesting version of a group of models he developed called Combination Product Sets, and while it's usually depicted on the corners of an octahedron, I find it easier to visualize with a cube. Plus, it's easier to draw. Anyway, to build a hexony, we need to start with four seeds. These can be any four odd numbers, but for this, we'll go with the simplest group, 1, 3, 5, 7, because I'm lazy and don't want to deal with big numbers. Oh, and because it creates the most consonants, which is kind of the point. But Mostly it's the laziness. The next thing we need to do is multiply these numbers together in pairs. So like 1 times 3 is 3, 1 times 5 is 5, 3 times 7 is 21, and so on, giving us six new numbers which represent our actual notes. We're still just dealing with ratios though, so to convert them into real pitches, we need to pick a reference point like this low A. It's not actually a part of our hexony, it's just going to serve as the one that these are all based on. Then we multiply that note's frequency by each of our note values, giving us 3, 5, 7, 15, 21, and 35, discard the starting note, and voila, we've made a hexony. It's really spread out though, the highest and lowest notes are like three and a half octaves apart. Fortunately, this system doesn't care about octaves, so we can just multiply and divide these by two until they're all right next to each other, giving us this. From here, it starts to get a bit hard to follow along on a flat piece of paper like this, so it's time to get 3D. I'm gonna take this paper cube my brother made and try to put our notes on it. But we can't just put them anywhere, there are rules to this. If two sides are touching, we want those two notes to sound consonant together, which means they need to share a factor from our seeds. So if we make this face our 1 times 3 side, then we can't put 5 times 7 here. It has to go on the opposite side, where it doesn't share any edges. 1 times 5 can go here, though, because it shares a 1 with this side and a 5 with this one. Then we can fill in the rest, and we've got ourselves a 3 dimensional map of consonant tonal space, which is kind of a mouthful, so I'll just call it a tonality cube. So what does it do? Well, each corner of the cube represents a triad made up of the three notes it's touching, but unlike normal harmony, each of these triads is completely unique. Let's go back to the major scale for a second. It's got three different major triads, here, here, and here, and if we ignore the note they start on, all three of them sound exactly the same. The ratios between their notes are identical. In the hexony, on the other hand, there are no such redundancies. It has its own version of a major triad found here, but... That's it. No other triad on this cube has that same frequency ratio. Wilson breaks the triads of the hexony up into two groups, the harmonic triads and the subharmonic ones. That major triad we just saw is harmonic. If we look at the notes that make it up, we see they all share a factor, 7. Since all we care about is ratios, we can just ignore that factor entirely, so this triad is built directly out of the other three seeds, 1, 3, and 5, although we've rearranged them to be 4, 5, 6 instead. Again, we can multiply by 2 as much as we want. The other harmonic triads works Similarly, each combining three of the seed factors to give us 5, 6, 7, 6, 7, 8, and 7, 8, 10. Those probably sounded a lot less pleasant to you though, and there's a good reason why. As we mentioned, the 4-5-6 ratio is pretty closely approximated by a normal major triad in standard tuning, but the rest of them don't have any sort of equivalent because standard tuning has nothing that even resembles the 7 here. The 6-7 to seven ratio is a little bit like a minor third, but it's absurdly flat, and the 7-8 to eight ratio is a really sharp major second, so even though in theory these should all still sound somewhat consonant, if you grew up listening to western music, they're gonna be pretty unfamiliar. Let's move on to the subharmonic 
harmonic triads. These are basically like the harmonic ones, but upside down. Going back to our four, five, six triad, we can see that it's made of two stacked intervals. We've got a four to five ratio and then a five to six ratio. But what if we flip those around so the five to six was on the bottom? Well, after doing some multiplying and dividing, we eventually find ourselves with a ratio 10, 12, 15, which conveniently enough is the just intonation version of a minor triad, and we can find it on the tonality cube here directly opposite our major one. Again, the other three subharmonics work similarly, turning the five, six, seven upside down gets this, six, seven, eight makes this, and seven, eight, ten makes this, and each of them is directly opposite its partner on the cube. Wilson referred to these triads as facets of the hexony, and the sort of major-minor pairs they create are central to his models of harmony. As we mentioned, though, the hexony is just one member of a much broader class that Wilson called Combination Product Sets, or CPSs for short. Specifically, the hexony is a 4-2 CPS, because it has four seeds, and you multiply them together in groups of two. In theory, though, you could make any kind of CPS you want with any number of seeds multiplied together in any amount. Besides the hexony, the other most popular set is probably the 6-3 CPS, with six seeds multiplied together in groups of three, resulting in a 20-note scale called an icosony. This requires a five-dimensional representation, though, and I don't think my brother can make that out of paper, so you'll just have to imagine. Which brings us to the final question. What's the point? Whenever I do a video like this, I always get people asking why we should care, why any of this is worth doing when a plain vanilla system like 12-tone equal temperament works just fine. But that, I think, is the point. Recognizing that the approach we use is just one of many, that even our most fundamental assumptions about how music works are actually just habits we've fallen into. Yes, the hexony has its flaws, but so does equal temperament. So does everything. Art isn't about being flawless, it's about figuring out which costs are worthwhile, and the hexony and other systems like it present a different perspective forcing us to question whether we use equal temperament because it's the best or simply because it's convenient. Anyway, thanks for watching and thanks to our Patreon patrons for supporting us and making these videos possible. If you want to help out and get some sweet perks like sneak peeks of upcoming episodes, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.